Follow the Money defines investigative journalism, and the Pandora Papers are probably the largest leak in the last decade. The main problem with these leaks is that you can question the morality of the people involved, but in reality, this is just a spectrum of grays with only a few of them actually crossing the line of legality. New data is coming in every single day, but as of shooting this video, this is October 7th, 2021, here's what happened, who was exposed, and more importantly, how tax havens are probably not going away and will continue to be used by those who can afford it to reduce their taxes. Most people cannot do the same thing. More than 100 billionaires in the world whose names show up in the Pandora Papers. What are the Pandora Papers? So we don't know precisely when the ICIJ began to get the info that led to many of these investigations, but we do know that it's been happening since 2013 at least. They followed the money. This phrase gained popularity after the Watergate scandal, but tracking money has been vital for uncovering who's behind the shadiest businesses in the world since long before Nixon. The problem is that power, greed, and corruption can sweep even the deepest trail. For decades, journalists have dedicated countless hours to following the money. And one important player is the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, the ICIJ. So this is a global organization that gets a lot of info from a lot of people. They even have a leak to us tab on their homepage. The ICIJ is behind some of the most important investigations. They released the Mauritius leaks, China cables, Panama Papers, and the Pandora Papers. So this latest leak is the biggest in history. 11.9 million documents totaling almost three terabytes of information. And tell, they tell the story of how the rich hide their wealth, avoid paying taxes, and yes, launder money. So the Pandora Papers investigation required the work of 600 journalists from 117 countries. They went through the records of 14 offshore service providers. Fact checking, digging into these files. It's up to the authorities to decide what to do. Our job as journalists at that point is done. And what came out of this was has devastating implications. Let's think of it as this parallel secret financial world where the rich and powerful safeguard their wealth. One way to do so is through offshore accounts, and these are outside the country that generates the money, in countries with low or no corporate tax. But then they create this network of corporations so complex that it's almost impossible to keep track until there's a leak, of course. And who does this? Well, big names. The Pandora Papers include 35 current and former heads of state, 300 politicians, and many celebrities from more than 90 countries. So if you want to know more about the people involved, you should check out Jake Trans killer video on the topic. He's gonna deep dive a lot more into that, while we're gonna talk a little bit about how these havens work. Offshore companies and tax havens aren't necessarily illegal or wrong, but they can be. And the key is how people end up using them. Why do tax havens exist? So a tax haven is a country with a specific set of characteristics that makes it compatible with reducing your tax burden. So the reality of it is that as much as the Panama or the Pandora Papers are scandalous and cause public revolt, most of the activities these companies or individuals are doing are strictly barely legal. Shady, gray, but in the context of the law, legal. So it's not as rare as you might think. It's estimated that 15% of all countries in the world have a legal system designated to motivate tax optimization. Normally, they're small, stable republics that don't have a lot of domestic activity. And because they're small, maybe they don't have a lot of national resources. So they see this foreign investment as a way for the company to thrive. So the most obvious policy that these countries implement is a reduced tax rate for non-residents. Essentially, if you're a non-national and you establish a company in their jurisdiction, you can get a marginal tax rate. So this varies from 0% taxes on capital gains. That's the money that you make if you invest in the stock market, or if, you, if you invest in a startup, and that investment increases in value, to extremely low corporate taxes, zero to 5% rate. So just a low tax rate for foreigners is not enough to get that tax haven title. So other policies more tax havens have are legal or administrative practices that prevent foreign authorities from getting data about their companies, their investors. Think Swiss banks. So tax havens also don't require a local company presence in order to do business. It means that a company can simply have a paper operation in the country without a single employee. Low transparency is another trait where governments negotiate custom taxes with specific companies. That certainly doesn't apply equally to all businesses. And finally, tax havens need to market themselves as a stable, democratic economies. Nobody wants to put money in a country with a government on the verge of collapse. So marketing, quiet marketing, AKA country branding, is absolutely essential. Get it? No, it's not an ad for Costa Rica. Anyway, most tax havens will deny being tax havens for reputation reasons, 
but more international pressure is forcing these countries to have less secrecy. So tax havens like Switzerland have lost some of their popularity. And they make this tax revenue, not Switzerland, but any tax haven, they make it up with different types of tariffs, like departure taxes or high import taxes on goods. And if you look at countries like Bahamas or Monaco, they thrive precisely because of these policies. The thin gray line. So the whole controversy with the Pandora Papers leak is not necessarily the legal aspect of it or the criminal aspect of it, because a lot of this tax optimization activities companies and individuals are doing are honestly 100% legal in the jurisdictions where they're operating. A huge company would not risk losing a legal battle over these practices. That's what I think makes people very angry, this sense of impotence on how the rich and corporate can avoid taxes and get away with it because it's somehow legal. So should these havens be allowed or can they be avoided? I think that's a question that would take a whole other YouTube channel to try and answer. But let me focus on some examples of how different companies are using these offshore entities, all the way from white legal, where we would like to place ourselves, to black illegal. So Slidebean is a US corporation. Most of our customers are in the US. Stripe, our billing system is in the US and our investors are in the US. So we need it to be a US corporation and that's where our headquarters are based. By the way, if you don't know what we do, we have this suite of tools for startup founders to help them with their fundraising from a pitch deck builder to an investor finder to financial modeling and expense tracking for their early stage companies. We felt a little bit like a press room as we were making this video, but we're not, we're, we're storytellers and we help founders present their company stories to investors. So you can go to slidebean.com to sign up to our tools. Also, the first five comments on our videos get a free invitation to my weekly office hours. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and that bell button to get notified. End of spot. Anyway, all of the Slidebean IP belongs to the US entity. So the US entity employs our engineering team so that the code that they write and the technology actually belongs to the US company. But we also have a subsidiary in Costa Rica. It's a legal company established in Costa Rica. And we established it there because 25 plus of our team members are based in Costa Rica and we needed to be compliant with the local regulations. So in the eyes of the law, these are two separate companies. Essentially the US company pays the Costa Rican company for its support, marketing and design services. Now to be compliant, we can't simply transfer what the other company spends. We have to include what's called a transfer price. So it's illegal for the Costa Rican entity to sell services to the US entity at cost. And that applies to a bunch of different countries. So this could be considered unfair competition by an interest group. So this Costa Rican entity needs to charge a market rate for the services it provides. This is true, by the way, we have to run a study every year on how much that market rate is. And the company needs to have a profit margin that's comparable to other companies in the country that are providing similar services. Again, this does not apply to Costa Rica alone. This is like a worldwide thing. And that tax revenue goes to the Costa Rican government at a hefty 30% rate. So yeah, pretty much it's the opposite of a tax haven. It's just a price of compliance. So Apple is one of the largest companies in the world. And we all know that when you buy an iPhone in the US, the revenue goes to Apple Inc. That's the legal entity in Cupertino that we all know of. But when you buy an Apple device abroad or when a distributor buys a batch of devices to sell abroad, they aren't paying the US based Apple Inc. They're paying Apple Operations International. That's an Irish company that has no employees, no physical presence, but they're wholly owned by Apple Inc. They've been for over 30 years. So between 2004 and 2014, Apple Ireland received around 110 billion euros in revenue in that entity and paid a low 2% tax to the Irish government. This was a bit of a scandal. The European Union started an investigation, they sued Apple, and they ruled that they had received illegal discounts and benefits from the Irish government. They issued a fine for 13 billion euro. And after years of appeals, Ireland and Apple managed to overrule the verdict and avoid the fine. But this case was not about the offshore entity. That was okay in the eyes of the US and the EU. It's not illegal. The lawsuit from the EU was on the tax discount that Ireland seemed to have given them. Now, if this is all legal, why would anyone complain? Well, the case the IRS makes is that Apple benefits from the US, their talent, the government stability, and the legal protection, and they should pay all of their taxes there. Apple defends by saying that no company pays more US taxes than them, which is technically true if you count the dollars, not the effective percentage rate. Now, is this ethical? It's really up for you to say in our comments below. And if Apple collected all of that revenue in the US at the 35% corporate tax rate, Apple would owe the US government $85 billion in taxes. Is that white hat worth $85 billion? 
I'm honestly not sure. The only small downside of doing this is that the money is stuck in Ireland. They can't bring it or spend it in the US unless they pay a repatriation tax, which is 35%, lower to 15 for a while during the Trump government. Now, Apple can spend their money from their subsidiary or they can use it to leverage to obtain loans from the US banks. So it's honestly not, not a big problem for them. Now, a darker tactic many companies use is transferring intellectual property to foreign subsidiaries. And Facebook did it in 2010. So they transferred some IP to Facebook International Holdings Unlimited blah, company, the Irish entity, trying to take advantage of a legal glitch called the double Irish loophole. So the assets transferred could have been code or branding, logos, and since these assets are owned by the Irish entity, the US entity then needs to lease them. So in 2018, Facebook Ireland saw revenues of $15 billion, which paid a comfortable tax bill of just $101 million. It could have been 500 plus million in the US. This is shadier, of course, but a lot of companies do it and they get away with it. Different countries have established regulations to make sure that the prices paid for this IP are fair, but it's a complex topic to navigate. Facebook didn't get in trouble for doing that. They got in trouble for the price at which they sold this intellectual property to the Irish subsidiary. Facebook reported that as 6.5 billion. The IRS thought it was a 21 billion thing, and that's how they built the case for a lawsuit. The trial was postponed because of COVID, but Facebook recently announced that they were closing their Irish subsidiaries. Other companies like Google also have them, and they're doing it as well, after the EU sort of cracked down in this loophole and wrote, wrote a new law to forbid it. The point is this tactic was shady. It was taking advantage of a loophole, but up until like a year ago, it was perfectly 100% legal. Now, both examples I've given you so far are pretty well known, great tactics many, many companies across the world use to pay fewer taxes. Notice how I haven't used the word tax evasion because tax evasion happens when you cross this legality line and when you commit a crime. So it's still early to tell which of the individuals or entities exposed in the Pandora Papers will actually stand trial because of illegal activities. The line is thin, and oftentimes it's an argument in court by a lawyer that determines if you stand on one side or the other of this line. Now, in the interest of showing an actual example of an illegal use of these tax havens, let me grab an example from the Panama Papers, which is Pandora's older brother. A blockbuster release turned out of the banking bombshell causing shockwaves around the world. Edward Snowden calling it the biggest leak in the history of data journalism. For context, the Panama Papers exposed 200,000 plus offshore entities, which caused a backlash and hit the reputation of many, many companies and many wealthy individuals but only a handful of people have seen jail time. Again, most of the activities are just barely on the right side of the law. So the US has charged four people in relation to the leak and only two have been sentenced so far. This is five years after the leak. Some leaks from the Panama Papers really, really pushed the line on legality. Iceland's former prime minister, for example, whose name I will not dare pronounce, uh, so he sold a Shell offshore company to his wife the day before he had to reveal his public records to become prime minister. And this Shell company stood to benefit from some of his own policies as prime minister. He was forced to resign, but quite remarkably, did not stand trial. The only case in the US tied to the Panama Papers with an actual conviction was a venture capitalist called Harl van der Goltz and his accountant, Richard Gaffey. So he started a film called Boston Capital Ventures, which actually funded a few early stage startups. Von der Goltz created a complex scheme of shell companies and bank accounts to hide his assets from the IRS. And hiding your assets is a big no-no in the eyes of a tax man. So doing business abroad is not illegal. Paying for foreign IP is not illegal. Notice my air quotes. As long as it's declared to the IRS. Do you see how thin this line got? So what's gonna happen now? The Panama Papers did lead to some public officer resignations, some awareness and some new legislation. But five years later, convictions are very, very few. The firm that handled the creation and the management of all these offshore accounts and all these shell companies, they did have to close down and they did face trial. Many politicians were forced to resign, mostly because of the political pressure. But again, few of them have actually faced criminal charges. Some banks, and some financial institutions were raided by the police. And in the end, some legislation was passed. But if this has happened again, it feels that few people have actually learned a lesson from it. And being named in one of these leaks is mostly a PR crisis for you that some people can manage to overcome. Some didn't. The truth is it's a scandal more than a criminal investigation. It's taking advantage of legal loopholes and that's not illegal. It's morally wrong, but it's not illegal. So 
what should we be doing differently?